on, um, on behalf of CSIS, I'm delighted to, to welcome you here to this talk by uh, Dr. Sri Mulyani Indrawadi. Uh, my name is Murray Hebert. I am the um, uh, Senior Fellow and Deputy Director of the Southeast Asia Program here at CSIS. We're delighted that Ibu Sri Mulyani has, has joined us here today, recognizing that she's been through a pretty busy patch with the World Bank IMF meetings that just have basically ended last weekend, but she says that people have been continuing here through, through much of this week. Uh, Ibu Sri Mulyani has been the um, managing director at the World Bank since 2010, and her portfolio basically covers the world. Uh, it's for, for those of us in this room, it's it clearly one of the priorities is East Asia and the Pacific, but it, she also is in charge of South Asia, Africa, Europe, Central Asia, Middle East and North Africa, and I just forgot the Caribbean, so I'm not sure what's left out. Uh, Sri Mulyani was the uh, finance minister of Indonesia before she came here. Uh, in, that, in that capacity, she was very uh, key in guiding uh, Indonesia's economic finance policy in Southeast Asia's largest economy in the years um, prior to coming here and also was managing the economy during the finances during the financial crisis during 2008 and 2009 when Indonesia ended up doing quite a bit better than a lot of its neighbors. Ibu Sirmulyani holds a PhD from the University of Illinois, so is no, new, no novice, no newcomer to the United States. And we welcome you to CSIS today, and what she'll do is she'll give a short talk, and then we'll follow it with questions. Well, you can choose, but it might be a little better for okay. the talk. Thank you. Thank you, Murai. Very good morning to all of you, and thank you for inviting me here. I heard that there are quite a lot of other prominent uh, guests uh, speaking in this uh, forum. And suddenly, um, I was asked to talk about <clears throat> the topic which is very close to my own profession, but also close to my heart. Uh, Indonesia, Southeast Asia, economic uh, performance, but also related to governance. I think when we talk about Southeast Asia, uh, this is a region, 10 country, uh, with a GDP total is 1.9 trillion US dollar. It's much, uh, it's bigger than India and the population 600 million is twice of United States, income per capita close to $4,000 uh, per capita, which is close to China. So it's really a region with huge potential and also provided a very good performance in terms of the economic, uh, as well as in, in this case, sometimes you see on the social progress. Uh, the growth in a decade is on average 5%. If we treat Southeast Asia as one economy, one country, uh, it is in the position of the ninth uh, largest economy uh, in the world. So that is the situation. And they, the AS ASEAN, which they established this uh, Southeast Asia country, uh, established the association since 45 years old, uh, uh, ago. They uh, also established what they call it the economic union or economic community accelerated into 2015. When I was finance minister, we heard that uh, the leaders met and then they said that why, why don't we move forward uh, the target to establish economic community into 2015. Of course, that was done when the situation in European is still not giving them the alarming signal about being the community means a lot of thing in this case. Um, but this is the region which is also very reliant on trade in really driving their growth. So if you talk about three decades or four decades of performance in the Southeast Asia, and if you look at the current statistic in which their trade to GDP ratio is 150%, then you didn't definitely see that this is the region which is going to be really affected by the global environment. And of course, the discussion on the IMF World Bank annual meeting uh, last week was mainly also dominated by the concern, worry of many Minister of Finance or even Prime Minister President who visited us. They share their concern about what is going to happen with the European crisis, the US outlook, as well as how this it will affect in terms of their economic performance. Many of those countries has done a good job in 2008 by doing a more responsive and timely counter-cyclical measure 
Many of them still have a room for the fiscal. Others is already exhausted in terms of their fiscal space. So they are now really facing, and maybe in, uh, in some sense, not really ready to face with the second cycle of crisis that will affect both from their external demand as well as the domestic demand. That is the theme which is shared by many developing countries, whether this is low-income country, middle-income country, and especially fragile state. But also it's become the issue in terms of how we can design the global growth return to the, what you call it, sustainable and inclusive and stable uh, growth pattern. Now, I was asked by the CSIS to speak about more on a governance and how this governance can contribute and play a role in economic performance. By definition, I think many people have their own perception about governance. They say, well, governance can be reflected into a many different perception idea. But I will define governance as the fairness, um, equity, and impartiality. I think that is the three uh, most important uh, element of when we talk about fairness, uh, governance, good governance, that is fairness, equity, and impartiality. And within that definition is definitely that's very close to many of the institutional problem. That is, if the institution, whether this is public, or especially public, but also private, can treat people with impartial, impartiality and fairness, and that will definitely not just the result or the end result of governance, but that will require what you call it a necessary condition that will make this institution behave like that. That is the setting of the institution, which adopting rule of law, effective law enforcement. You have rule of law, but you don't have an effective law enforcement and judicial system. It's become the necessary condition for any system that want to adopt a good governance. And certainly within that element of fairness, equity and impartiality can only be enforced and perceived as a fair by the public if there is a transparency and also accountability. And this is exactly the challenge for any institution when we cl they claim that governance have strong correlation with the economic performance. Historically, empirically, we can see it. Any country who has much better governance, they are going to be able to deliver more sustained growth at the macro level, at the micro level, even if you can see it, that they usually deliver better in terms of the health indicator, whether this is on the mortality of the infant mortality, or in terms of the health services and uh, uh, road quality and education. So there is a strong, at least empirical evidence showing that there is a strong relationship between good governance and good development result. The problem is, of course, when we talk about governance and growth, and especially when you are putting within the context of today, because many of us are saying that governance that will provide with certainty is definitely lowering the transaction cost. And transaction cost, which is low, meaning that you can achieve a much better efficiency, or in this case, in this case, uh, it can also provide more certainty. Lower transaction cost, efficiency, certainty, they are all good for business. And that's why you have a good growth or better growth. That is the logical correlation between governance and growth. But if you put it within the Southeast Asia, and you are going to have a quite interesting observation. Because if you look at even an Indonesian case, Indonesia during President Suharto for 32 years, if you talk about whether we adopted good governance, everybody will say, well, we have a, a lot of corruption, especially at the elite, top elite. But the performance is not really that bad. The economic performance for 32 years is the average is good, if you can consider it that 7% is good, of course. And the poverty reduction is there. So there is also a mixed feelings about with corruption, which is linked closely with the concept of governance, with the effectiveness of any regime and system to actually deliver what you call it a good economic performance. That is the development, whether you measure it in a growth or in this case, poverty reduction. But why then Indonesia in 97, 98, after uh, shocking by the financial crisis, that 
suddenly people feel that they want to have. It is maybe not sudden because in the past it was repressed, closed, so it, it is not coming up in a headline or in the news. But it's become sudden because then suddenly we become open and transparent. So it is not about the temporary good performance of economy because you can also see it now in the Middle East situation. Uh, quite a lot of authoritarian regime with the corruption at the top elite, they can still deliver a good growth, sometimes a little bit poverty reduction. But definitely they are not providing with what they call it dignity, freedom, and equality. So it is about the problem of sustainability rather just the temporary performance. And when I call it temporary, it can be long. <laughs> 30 years is not temporary in this case. It's long enough to actually achieve something good. And, and that's why I think it is more about the sustainability. And there are other things that for many of the new democratic system, there is also a sense of new element of frustration by this system. Because check and balances and participatory decision-making processes definitely invite so many parties in your decision-making process. And especially if, if it is related to the public policy, of course. And that means in a country which have still unevenness, whether this is on education level, opportunity in the past, legacy, then you are going to have this participation is more complicated creating complication and not even giving what they call it the value added of contesting idea so you have the best option of policy. Because the idea of inviting everybody to participate, of course, you can contest the idea, you can contest even in terms of prescription, policy option, and everybody become part of it and own that decision. And that will create more sustainability, the feeling of treat treating them in a dignity and the fair, fairness and uh, uh, equity in terms of the participation. And that, oh, with that, we will expect that the decision is going to be long lasting and is going to be uh, sustainable. But what is maybe become the many of country expressing, and this is going to be a very good uh, observation, because many of the democratic uh, uh, system government which is elected, they are asked by their voter to deliver fast enough on the development result. They sometimes argue that it, is, it, can, it cannot be done fast enough because we have to go through this democratic process. Well, especially uh, during this time, when you are seeing how the democracy provides us with a good example of United States decision-making process on the debt and budget. So everybody said that this is more serving a process rather than result. And many developing countries really asking and aiming for result because they need to catch up. They are still in lower level. This is something that need to be put within the perspective because it can create a more mixed observation, but also it could also come to the wrong conclusion. Some country can be then make the conclusion that, well, okay, maybe what we need is not a democracy, but authoritarian, as long as it is efficient, effective in delivering, that is gonna be fine. But it will betray historically in terms of what you call it participation and sustainability, and especially when you talk about the dignity and freedom. Why it is important? Because within the development concept, and this is also quite true in many of the Southeast Asia country, I'm talking about Indonesia. I suspect that in this case, when the development, even if it is delivered, it was delivered by the authoritarian government, you create a middle class which is thick enough, and this middle class is asking for more than just growth. And they are asking participation and so on. And that cannot be satisfied within the system which is not democratic, transparent, and establishing more impartiality and fairness and equity. So this is the natural demand which is going to threatening the development achievement itself. Now, unfortunately, of course, when we are talking about good governance, and especially within the public sector, my own experience, what is going to be the element of building good governance? I will say four elements, which is very important. First, 
it relate you cannot sit and do the rhetoric of good governance if you don't have the public institution especially who has the capacity who has to who adopt transparency and accountability my own experience as a finance ministers we can talk about i'm now opening up my minister of finance we want to adopt good governance but you can sometimes frequently embarrass when your own staff have no competency and capacity and that's against the objective of building trust of the public because when you say that we are now adopting good governance we are opening up our institution we become transparent we want to become accountable and please correct us please uh, criticize us and they can find a lot of things to criticize because of the capacity cons consistency this is a very difficult choice especially at the initial stage when you really have to build the institution toward good governance because you still have a lot of legacy issue legacy problems structurally the institution cannot change overnight while at the same time you've already tell public that you are adopting it and there is no backtracking and if you backtracking you can easily then criticize that you are no longer so capacity is definitely very important and unfortunately when you talk about capacity competency of the institution it takes longer time the question is always the very difficult trade off in a short time when the minister is there in which they have to deliver something while at the same time they have to deal with the institution which is not up to the level so many developing country and southeast asia in this, in this case is actually one of the example that you really actually want to deliver something but the institution is not up to the level that you can rely on that institution to really deliver according to what you want so the development challenge is always you have to develop while you also have to build your institution it's a different from the more advanced country in which you can really discussing about policy with the assumption that the institution is there for you to 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 do their function the second one on a building good governance is participation and oversight by civil uh, so society and by public in general this is a very important element and i can share you again um, uh, my own uh, 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 um, experience the budget is become open the budget is become open in which in in this case you upload it to the website you even in this case uh, publish it to the media surprisingly when everybody in the past everybody asking for transparency you become transparent but you see that the quality of check and critic and analysis is not immediately good so I, in this case, you become frustrated. Who's going to be my partner when I'm debating about this policy? Because when you talk about the budget with the whole option, this is the revenue side, this is going to be how I'm going to generate revenue, I'm going to collect tax, and the tax is going to be in this sector, especially because it is under tax or so many things. And then this is the revenue side, and the revenue is going to be channeled. We have a lot of subsidy. We also built for the road infrastructure and you want to have a debate with it's really looking at the budget and no one there to criticize to even understand the budget to read the budget so in this case we have to really have a lot of creativity for example in the minister of finance of indonesia we do the contest of high school student how to read budget well, we have a very good participation. And amazingly, I must say, sometimes the result is much better than even the bachelor degree thesis, <laughs> which is, I think, is good. I mean, you will, not, uh, you will be surprised when you are opening up and to give you this access that you are going to have so many good things coming from unusual places or from a different group of people. But then, I also actually quite, uh, discussing a lot with many of the media editor and so on because I said if you don't invest your reporter to understand about the real issue of the budget as much as you are having openness the openness is not educating people it's not really providing with the value added so there there is really a lot of effort and investment need to be done in order to really build good governance, not only in a public institution, but those parts which really playing 
what we call it in in a, in in, in economy is of demand side of governance. Who demand good governance? People, civil society, media. But in order for them to be a good, effective demand, they really have to know what they are really asking. It's, and that is exactly what you call it, the quality of the participation and oversight. The third element is creating competitive uh, private environment. So I think this is also related to the corruption, actually. Good governance should have the correlation that the corruption cases or prevalence is going to be less. And that's not always easy. In an institution in which you have quite a lot of what I call it legacy issue. In my own experience, the first thing is always that. In the past, when I first entered the Minister of Finance, they always said, well, Ibu, of course, they become corrupt because their salary is not even enough to pay their need monthly. OK, how long it takes? Well, it's, it's only three weeks, two weeks, and that's why they need to find other income. So they said they justify the corruption because even at the minimum level, that they said that they cannot perform their function. OK, that means this has become a vicious circus. As a Minister of Finance, you have to cut that circle first. OK, I will eliminate the justification of corruption by correcting to what you call it a it's just the normal. It is not become highly paid because I always said at the time in Indonesia, that if you want to be rich, you are not working at the Minister of Finance. <laughs> you have to work outside. But the country, the government owe you a decent life as part of the civil society that you have to exist in your society as a decent group of people who's doing your public function. And that's why you deserve a decent level of salary. It's not becoming rich. If you want to be rich and you think that you are so skillful and so smart, you can go outside the government. And that is something which is, I think, justified. In many governments in the world, which is good, they actually have a very good revolving door between the public-private uh, role, which is, I think, should be there. So that is one thing. At least what you call it, you eliminate the first reason for them to justify that I become corrupt because it is necessary. But then, even when you deliver that, you are going to immediately going to face, because the media, the parliamentary member, political party, CSO, NGO is going to be, well, you've already increased the, the salary. Why you still have a corruption? Or why you not deliver the services? They always think that immediately when you increase the salary, immediately tomorrow my staff is going to be, become the angel of the, of, the, of the Indonesian government civil servant. It's not. So you really have to do a lot of battle inside in order for you to make sure that they are going to be impartial, but at the same time they are still competent and reliable in delivering public services. And that is the, the challenge of building good governance. The fourth is the political accountability, of course. At the end, you cannot say the building governance and so on if you are not accountable politically. And with that, it's certainly you have to communicate what is the result goals that you want to achieve, or even in this case, if you part of the public service delivery, you have to be able to say that this is going, what, what it takes in order to deliver a certain services. And then people, public is going to ask the accountability in terms of the result. Whether you achieve the growth rate, whether you achieve the education level, whether you achieve the deficit financing, whether you achieve the revenue target, whether you achieve the spending target, or in this case, whether you achieve the service delivery level. And that's the area which I think is going to take a lot of also action from the demand side. Many innovation can actually accelerate this political accountability because it is not just you finish your term and that's it. But they demand to have what you've already achieved every term that you already serve for the country and in this case is going to have connection with the, with the people. So th that is the, the challenge of building a good governance. For many ASEAN countries, Southeast Asian countries, it's actually not internal governance which is important. Why? Because the global world has changed. 
you see that a lot of rhetoric in the past three years, especially since 2008, when there is a Lehman Brothers problem, U.S. problem, and then now followed by the European. In the past three years, the economic discussion is always said that the emerging country, developing country, now become the mother of the global economy. They, in terms of growth, they are always higher, but also in terms of the crisis, the reason in 2008, they can still perform well. They can manage their economic performance better, although they are facing with a global shock. Now, with that environment, and even if you look at the statistic, that developing countries now contribute more or even 50% of the global growth. If you look at the China, even with the projection that we are now having uh, a partnership with the Chinese government in doing the Chinese 2030 scenario, if the current performance is going to be maintained, by 2030, China is going to be the largest country in the world. They are now become the largest exporter. They are the second number two importer in the world. They become always in the top one or two in the world. But China is only one country reflecting many developing countries, emerging countries, who is now moving up to the ladder of the global scene. So for them, it is not only internal governance that they are asking or were asked to build. Many of these emerging countries now has been asked to play role on the global governance. I think Bob Zulik is give many speeches which is saying that it's time for many developing countries to play a role, not only just in the past donor, recipient, lender, borrower, but you become the shareholder and stakeholder of the global economy. And that's why being a shareholder, you have to shape the policy. You have to actively talk, not only saying that you are there and we are here yours and ours, but become uh, uh, you and us in this case. But we talking about our global system. And when talking about the global system, this is something that need to have a very good opportunity for many emerging countries. I was the finance minister in Indonesia. I actually sometimes feel that that expectation is just too much for us. Because as a finance minister of Indonesia, Every day, you have to deal with the parliament, you have to manage the economy, you have to improve the institution, you have to reform. So there are so many domestic tasks. But every time I travel to attend the ASEAN Finance Minister meeting, ASEAN Plus 3, APEC meeting, IMF World Bank, ADB meeting, they expect us to say something and to play a role. And we said, oh my God, who's going to support me? Who, okay. Do, we ha do I have still spare thinking, <laughs> brain, or even attention to this global while well, every day you are going to be pressured by all the domestic? But this is going to be the demand of the global, global system, global economy. So many emerging countries now in this position, and that's why we are now in the World Bank, is also try to create what we call it the Middle Income Country Club. Because many of them, when they are facing my own ex example, when I have, and I very courageously at that time said, okay, I'm going to initiate the meeting of finance minister as a sideline of the UNFCCC, that is the Climate Ch COP 13 in Bali. The first time climate change meeting, there is an initiative of finance minister to also discuss about climate change. Actually, usually in the past, the climate change, or oh, that's environmental or minister of uh, environmental or uh, at least those which is related to environment. At, at most, in many advanced countries, is foreign affairs. But never actually Minister of Ta Finance talking about climate change. So we have to educate ourselves, but actually that put it there. So I have this initiative. I was asked, well, how about you hosting that? Oh, okay. I think it's out of my own passion, and which is logically we, ha we, we want to live in a good environment. We know that the sustainability of environment is endangered by growth. So by instinct, I said, I think environment is very important. I have passion, and I want to host it. And then suddenly I asked my staff, and then they have no idea. They have no experience. <laughs> what is climate change? <laughs> Who's the party? Who should be invited? What is the issue? And so on. So you really, when you are courageous enough to become host, 
you really have to deal with a lot of capacity building again. And sometimes you need international community to help you. Okay, give me what is the agenda, who should be, who should be invited, how we are going to organize it. Something which is for you, like CSIS, in here in Washington, every corner you have the experience to deal with this kind of thing. But here in Washington, of course, everywhere know the center of power of the world, of course. But in developing country, hosting international event is something which is very seriously not yet to become the industry. Or so that kind of thing, when you asking many of developing country playing their role in shaping the global governance, whether you are talking WTO, when you are talking about the reform in the IMF and World Bank, or in now global financial institute, uh, system. They are actually struggling about how, they, and the most, with their domestic as well as their international role, the most they certainly can do, which is close, is actually use their own experience as a developing country in order to voicing what is actually need to be seen or need to be considered when you are shaping a policy at the global level. And that is now if you see many of the developing countries starting to also ASEAN, ASEAN plus three is definitely there. And they're becoming more organized. Even in this case, if you look at the agenda that they are discussing, it's actually quite ambitious. And they can actually create also a good discipline among themselves. Because if they leave it alone to become just individual country playing their individual role globally, they don't have this pressure, which is a positive, constructive pressure for them. I give you one example. That is the single window of the ASEAN. I mean, this is a very practical. The ASEAN has already lowering their tariff. They want to become one trade zone. It's supposed to be the flow of goods should be free across the ASEAN. But besides lowering tariff, they say that each custom have, custom institution of each of these country have their own way of doing business. So it's create a lot of frustration in them of the what kind of form that need to be filled. And even this case, it can create a lot of unnecessary tension. For example, asking how exactly, how much exa exactly that we export to Singapore? and how much exactly Singapore is exporting to us. There is a lot of dispute and that's become more suspicion and the trust is not there. And that's why creating a one single window in which all good will be connected and the system is going to be more uniform and then the system and the process is going to be more or less uh, standardized is very good. It's good for business, it's good for the economy, it's good also for the governance. But you have to be very sure for Indonesia, because the Indonesia is the biggest country in ASEAN, when we are quite courageous saying that, okay, we signed the single window. So when I was finance minister, my staff informed me, Ibu, we have already agreed a single window. What single window? There is one single window. That is, we are going to connect it with Singapore, Malaysia. But which window that we are going to use? <laughs> because in Indonesia, we have Tanjung Priok in Jakarta window, we have Medan, another window, we have Surabaya, another window, and that's all big, so not to mention Sulawesi in which we have Ujung Panda. So for us as a big country, the task is much even bigger. And that's why I said, okay, could we at least show that the goodwill, we will try to improve and standardize the window in Tanjung Priok because this 60% of our trade is coming in and out from Jakarta. After that, we will then will build the other. But certainly in this case, it's, it was perceived and appreciated by many of business community. We move very, far, uh, very uh, ambitiously in order to create a good governance. And, and that's actually perceived very well. And that's also shown to many much uh, smaller countries like Laos, Cambodia. I, I didn't actually embarrass by telling them, well, you know my problem and your problem is not that different. You talk about capacity, I also have the capacity problem. You have a corruption, I also have a corruption problem. You have this complexity, I have also the complexity. But if I can do it, then you can do it also. And that can create a very good discipline in uh, managing. So that is going to be many of what you call it the global governance uh, challenge. I think many emerging country is going to play more forceful role, but of course they are going to use more their own domestic 
experience and lesson in order for them to say something. And of course, credibility of many emerging countries can only be supported when they, they call it, put your house in order. Exactly. They are now putting their house in order, macroeconomic policy relatively now sound, governance and institutional building is in the process to be improved, and then they play a role at the regional as well as the global. So I think I will stop up to here. In short, I think the conclusion, while the Southeast Asia is, it is a very dynamic region. It is, a, you, call it, you call it tiger economy. Um, we have another economy which we call it lion economy, that is Africa now. So you are going to have tiger, you have lion, you are going to have dragon. So we have a lot of animal. Uh, and I think they are building the right policy or uh, the right institution. They are adopting a sound uh, policy. Certainly in these cases, governance is part of the very important element of the success uh, of sustaining the growth. I'm not telling only just a temporary performance of the growth, but sustaining in a medium and long term. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Ibu Sirmiliani. That was uh, a very thought-provoking overview of the, uh, the uh, issues that affect uh, countries as they try to uh, to struggle with providing better governance in their uh, own economies. Um, and um, so we really uh, appreciate uh, your, uh, your very uh, thoughtful insights on that. We're going to open it up now for, for discussion. Um, maybe if I could ask the first question. You've given a, a good overview of what the components uh, of, of governance are, some of the challenges in achieving governance. but if I don't know if this is too difficult in your current hat, you're wearing your current hat, but how, if you had to grade ASEAN in term, ASEAN countries, especially the major economies and how they're doing in establishing good governance, what grade would you give them if you were their professor? Yeah. <laughs> this is like Prince George, you change from A, B, C, D to uh, zero to 100. Either way, either way. <laughs> the curriculum. Well, the ASEAN, I mean, the governance in terms of uh, the scale for ASEAN. Or you can pick individual countries, too, <laughs> whichever one you feel. Uh, that's going to be very tricky. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it, yeah, in a way, we have the CPIA. What, what does the CPIA uh, stand for? That is the indicator that measures the governance effectiveness. It is not going to be like a indicator that just showing one element, because the CPIA is telling about how long it takes for you to pay tax, how long it, I mean, there are so many, the composite indicator that is then come up with one skill. So in that, I, I'm not going to have, uh, to give a skill which is different from CPIA. I'm, I'm, I, I don't remember which country in what position, but I'm sure Singapore has been perceived as a high. Uh, Indonesia still struggle a little bit low, but there is a progress. Um, Malaysia, is, I think, is also close to a, a higher position. So that is more or less the composition. I think Vietnam, in this case, I've been dealing with Indonesia and looking at Vietnam, they are all having a similar problem like Indonesia in 1890 in which the role of state is there, the uh, competition is there, they are struggling in terms of how to adopt or maintain good macroeconomic policy when there is a structural problem in their institutional, especially related to state-owned enterprises. So I think many of these countries have a different position on their governance indicator. Cambodia is definitely another, Laos, and then Myanmar. So I guess I'm, I'm just telling, maybe Indonesia, we made some progress. There is a little bit now perception about worry whether there is a, this progress is going to be continued. But definitely the composition of what you call it, reform in order to simplify the cost of doing business, the process of doing something to get the permit, it's, 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 it's actually there. Well, um, open up the floor. If you have a question, raise your hand. Uh, there's some microphones. Uh, they'll come to you. And, and uh, 
you for here. Please um, uh, identify yourself and, uh, and then give us your question. Hi, my name is George Gorman. I'm an MA candidate for International Affairs at American University. And I had a question about uh, what institutional reforms can be implemented to strengthen federal local government communication and ensuring federal policies and goals are, goals are implemented on the local level. Um, thinking specifically about places like Kalimantan where local governments can, um, can sometimes operate almost independently and uh, uh, in, implement negative aspects of, of deforestation and exploiting resources. Uh, how can this be rectified? Well, there is a reform which is already adopted since 97-98, which is related to the local government. That is, first they become decentralized and have the autonomy. The idea is actually very good, and for Indonesia, it's, 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 it's very logical because it's a big country. That is to closer the government accountability to its own people, and that's why you delegated the power to local government. In the past, during President Suharto time, when you are even asking for any business license and so on, you really have to go to Jakarta, and that's become the very centralized authority, but then it's become a corruption also. And not to mention uh, the process it takes to, to have that kind of permission or uh, uh, agreement by the government. Now it, it's become decentralized and uh, have enjoying the local autonomy. That's the first reform. You're asking what is going to be the next reform. There is an implication of any step on the first reform. First, they are closer to the people but the capacity is not there. So institutional capacity is there because the idea of closer to the people is become direct accountability, whether this is related to the service delivery on education, health, basic services, clean water, and so on. Many local governments actually don't have this capacity. And also for Indonesia, the political decentralization has not actually follow very uh, closely with the fiscal decentralization. Revenue side is still government, central government. Some of the revenue component, for example, like revenue on oil and gas, has a very explicit, explicit formula how you divide it between national and local government, even in this case on the natural resource related to forestry. Now, even at my time, they're even asking about the cigarette, because the revenue from the, the cigarette is actually very high, and they are asking for the revenue sharing, which is actually theoretically is, is, is not there, but political pressure is there. So the revenue decentralizing, the revenue side is only partial. There is a law which is now giving more room for the local government to generate their own revenue. So local tax is gonna be, or is already adopted. I think two, two years ago, they have the new law on the local tax. So. There is a potential revenue side. On the spending side, it's really their own. So the fiscal decentralization is more on the expenditure side, and that's exactly what you mentioned. That is, they can spend their money according to their own local political choices. And there is, of course, direct election, there is a local parliament, and so on. But the design is good, the result is uneven. Some, can, some local government is really good, progressive, even at the municipality. Other is actually like behind, either because of leadership problem, whether this is also cap capacity problem, or even in this case, because they are still in a very early nascent democracy at the local level. Local civil society is not there. They don't know how to ask for accountability. They cannot exercise what I call it earlier, good governance, what they really ask the local government to deliver. So this is going to be the, th the theme for Indonesian reform, what you call it second and third generation of reform, is actually the reform at the institutional capacity and the effectiveness of this democratic openness system to really deliver what the people want. There is some progress that there are still a lot of homework need to be done. John? 
Sure. John Phipps with Visa. Um, actually, my question leads more from your comments. Um, you talked about mm -hmm. uh, a greater share of responsibility for developing emerging countries for global governance. And what we're seeing is uh, sort of a push by a, some prominent emerging countries to change the way in which, um, how would you say, some of the rules are set. Um, and I would say this applies to the IMF and World Bank. Um, uh, what we're seeing, or we think we're seeing, is uh, you know areas where there was sort of an adopted, <coughs> or adopted standard. Okay, what is good governance? You know, there's an agree upon standard that we try to measure on a global level. And yet, what we're seeing perhaps is a, some pushback, saying, "Hey, that standard may not be the best standard, or may not be the best standard for us." And so you know, in terms of like uh, in trade relationships, instead of what we thought of as open and transparent markets, now it's, there's pushback, well, let's, let's, you know, move beyond, or let's, let's erect barriers that aren't necessarily um, fall within the rules of tariffs and non-tariff barriers. So it's a long question, but how much pushback do you see on that level? Is the is the institution itself coming under a lot of pressure to, in a sense, be more lax in governments, governance structures, uh, in what, what rules it applies in its lending policies? So, for instance, you know, instead of, you know, the model being, hey, you must be transparent now, it's, well, it's going to take longer. Maybe we need to change the rules a bit, but we still need the money now. Um. <clears throat> I think it's good to put it within the context of uh, you revering whether this is affecting the way the IMF or is in this case bank in engaging with this country, given that they sometimes have a different view or still pushing back. There is really a constant uh, discussion as well as interaction with them. Uh, many of developing country, when they first respond and making a speech in the public, in international fora, they are always positioning themselves as a victim, of course, of whatever the legacy historical uh, setting in the past. But now, with their size is getting bigger, their role is becoming bigger, the claim of become a victim is no longer credible. Okay? And that's why for them to say that I am now become part of the shareholder, this is an evolutionary role change that still in the process of shaping, if I can call it that way. The, the interaction, the kind of interaction which is showing that there is a different or there is an interest saying that give us a breathing space, give us a learning lesson so that we can catch up. So then if we have the capacity and the real readiness, we will go to, uh, we will comply and adopt the international standard. There is an element of truth in that. Because I myself in Indonesia, when I was, this is really a debate within the cabinet at that time, when we said that we've already signed for the free trade agreement. And then I said, when it was signed by the leaders before, we just actually following by 2012, uh, this is going to be lower into 5% or even zero. So there is no really tariff barrier. And many ministers actually have a genuine anxiety, not in terms of that there will be Many of the domestic player is not going out of the business, but sometimes it's a very genuine concern regarding how I should protect the people. And what is actually telling is that many of developing countries, despite their commitment to agree on a liberalization and so on, they sometimes forget to prepare their own domestic institution so that when you are opening up to your, your country, actually then you will be at that time relying how to protect, for example, the most vulnerable, the poor people through a good social safety net. If you are going to deal with consumer which is going to be facing with a very competitive company offering you so many things, there should be a consumer protection. If there is unfair business practices, there must be something there. And it is not there. Many of country, developing countries, has not yet actually building that institution. 
so that when you are opening up, you get the benefit of competition and open, but then you also protecting, especially the people which really deserve to be protected, where they are vulnerable to to the the, the power of industry, the power of uh, sometimes uh, company which is not really comply to good governance in a way. So in a way, I think there is a genuine, but also it can be also used by the free rider to actually saving the narrow interest group. So in a way, I think many developing countries now is going to be in a position, if they are in a position to only just, hey, you, you have to adopt this principle, I think that is not going to be a good communication uh, mechanism to get what you call it, the real ownership. The essence, and the most important part here is actually developing country to become part of the owner of global governance, global policy, and so on. And that's why the debate can be open. It can be perceived that it is a pushing back, but I think I can testify in the bank, I don't, I don't see that we are relaxing. Actually, we are still struggle with so many safeguards which is still there when we are lending the money that you have to make sure that the indigenous people will be treated well. We have to make sure that the environmental is gonna be taken care of. We have to make sure that they are adopting a governance that makes sure that the resource, resource is not going to be corrupted. So I don't see that even there is on, uh, any relaxing. Even in the IFC side, we also asking the IFC when they are investing in the, in, in the developing and in any country, they also bring this value. Because at the end, many developing countries is not only just need the capital, they're actually importing a set of value when the capital coming to this country. That is about not only technology, not only the money, but also the way you work the way you organize yourself, the way you engage with the local community, the way you interact with the government. If this investor coming with the behavior which is not giving them that value added, is actually ruining also or destroying the value. Because if the investor coming with a bad behavior of polluting, of destroying the indigenous people, or even in this case, bribing the government official, they are just acting just like other economic animal. So in the way actually this has become a more consistent, interactive, and continuous interaction. What I can actually maybe have a more positive and optimistic perspective with the openness now, with the technology information in which you have a Facebook, or Twitter, and so on, you will not underestimate that the inconsistent behavior can sustain. When you do the rhetoric or you play a very good rhetoric publicly, or in this case for a company, you make a very good advertisement, painting yourself your, that your company is taking care of people, taking care of environment, comply on good government, paying good tax, but you are behaving differently, people will easily know that you are not consistent. So in this case, I think it applies to public institution, politician, but also apply to many corporations. I'm not sure in this case that many uh, emerging country is really want to have a different standard or value. What they really want is the fairness and equity. And when they become large, actually it serves their own interests to adopt the same good principle on a governance because it will not serve them. Domestically, it will be very, very difficult for them to explain their own domestic constituency. They say, hey, you know what? I'm in an international forum. I've been very courageous to refuse that any investor should protect our people. It, it won't ring any good sound for, for many of the people in their own, or even this case, I will allow any investor coming to our country as long as they bring money. I don't care whether they are going to just dump a lot of pollution and treat them. Of course, it's not going to be. It is not, I mean, when they adopt that kind of principle, it's not serving the interest of the West or the international standard. It's serving your own people. So they know that it is going to be that. Okay. Andy? Thank you. Thank you, Mary. And uh, thank you, the Ibu Sri Mulyani. Uh, my name is Andy Bayuni. I'm with the East West Center, and I'm also a journalist with the Jakarta Post. You mentioned about the lack of a credible counterpart when you open up the budget for public uh, debate. 
And you mentioned the media was also one of the partners that you were expected. And in my defense, I guess, uh, many of my uh, journalists we train to how to read the budget, they were poached. So, <laughs> and, then, and, then, and they went to work for financial companies. But that's, that's uh, I mean, that's, that's a story. It's not, I'm not uh, defending myself. But I can understand the lack of, uh, you know, credible debate in Indonesia on issues very important like the budget. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one is uh, about, you know, when you talk about the four elements for good governance, uh, you know, first one was the capacity of the public institutions, and number two was uh, you know, oversight by civil, civil society. I can't remember number three, but number four you mentioned about political accountability. Now, when it comes to Southeast Asia, uh, you know, when, when we rank, uh, I'm, I'm looking at the ranking by Freedom, Freedom, Freedom House, of countries that are regarded as democracy or you know, free or not free. Uh, you know, countries like, that are successful economically, like uh, Singapore, Malaysia, they don't rank as democratic. Right? Indonesia ranks higher, but your, your ranking of the good governance, uh, you, know, you put Singapore and Malaysia quite high. So I'm just asking about you know, the, the, uh, the benchmarks that you use when you measure about the political accountability being the number four element in that uh, good governance. Uh, the second question is about this, the heavy reliance of Southeast Asia on export markets. Uh, there have been talks since the global economic crisis about Asia, not just Southeast Asia, but East Asia uh, as a whole trying to decouple you know, from, from the West, from the United States. Uh, I, I would like to hear your take about the feasibility of East Asia decoupling from the United States uh, or even the desirability for, for them uh, in doing that, and uh, what, what, how is uh, the World Bank see this, this issue, whether is this something that the World Bank would encourage uh, East Asian countries to actually go that way, or you want to continue to promote more inter integration uh, between the economies in the world? Thank you. I think on the first point, um, maybe the word is not credibility, but comp capability of the civil society, including media, because I'm not questioning the credibility of media. It's you to judge whether they are credible or not. But capacity and the ability to become the reliable partner is certainly there. And you see that it's very difficult. When you train, you have a good reporter, they are going to be then hijacked by the other company because they become very good, in, especially Jakarta Post, I, I'm sure they are going to be high. Um, I think your question is about political accountability. It, it is not saying that the political accountability should be democratic in the way. P people can be accountable in a monarch system. They can be accountable politically. The accountability is saying that you have this power, whether this is power coming from God, whether it's coming from your family, or coming from people who elect you. When you hold this power, it is not just to serving that power. The power will serve whoever is going to, in this case, people. In a democratic system, you say this as people. So you're asking about three, actually, democratic system, political accountability, and good governance, in a way. You can be non-democratic but adopt good governance. When you say that uh, any king, I think if you read a lot of story about 1,001 days of Arabic, there is a good king who can, he, every night you go and sneak out to see how the people suffer and then the king will give something. The political accountability has been set through their own system of accountability. In a democratic system, there is an election based on the promise that you are going to deliver, you are elected, and then you have to deliver. If you are good, you will be re-elected. If it is not, then you are going to be toppled or changed, and then there will be a new regime. And there is a check and balances. So in a way, this is not going to be one easy instant correlation, because as I said, the quality of democracy to deliver political accountability is not instant and immediate or automatic. You can be a very good, you can have a democratic system, but a very messy political accountability. Or even in this case, you can have a very democratic system, but it's a very bad governance. Because it's not automatically there. 
And that is exactly so for so many countries which is adopting democracy. You are going to still have a lot of homework to build that democracy to function according to what is the goals because the democracy, democracy itself is not the goal. This is the system that will facilitate a country to achieve their goal through a contract with the, your father, which in which you believe that this is going to be a good mechanism. So in this case, the check and balances need to be there. You need an impartial justice system, which is not co-opted by the politician, political party. You try, you have to try to avoid the captive or captured situation in which certain interest group can really hijack the interest of the big, the people, through their policy influence. That kind of thing is another thing which is, I think, in democratic system, they can still survive. Bad governance, uh, what you call it, interest group, they will use the democratic system in order for them to pursue their, their, uh, their, their, their objective. And that's why uh, it is really a continuous process. And that's why I said democracy is not a panacea. It's not going to be automatically tomorrow with democracy you are going to have. This is exactly also when I share and meet. Uh, in Montreal, I was invited by Civicos. This is the NGO organization internationally. And then I met with some NGO from the Middle East they start sharing their frustration that, oh, I thought that after Hosni Mubarak is not there, uh, uh, President Ali is not there, we are going to have an easy easy system, a much better system. Now they are getting frustrated with the, the economic situation and so on. Well, the freedom is just the beginning. You need a lot of continuous work. This is like a project in which you're just opening up and then you have to start building it. Sometimes you think that after opening up the, the door and immediately you are going to have a new palace is going to be provided by you, it's not. So that is going to be something which, then I share the, the Indonesian experience in which takes 10 years. If you see Indonesia now, it seems that Indonesia is fine, it's not. If you take a look like 99, Murai was there and you, he knows very well what is the struggle of Indonesia at that time. You just open all the, media and the uh, news at that time. So th that is maybe um, the position on a democratic, political, accountability, and good governance. And finally, and you know that uh, there are countries which is provide you with a very good example in which they are not really democratic, but they adopt good governance, and they have a good political accountability. I don't have to name name, but there is a country <laughs> like that. So uh, I think uh, this is something intellectually we are going to be actually forced to always think, but for our own experience in Indonesia, we are not regretting and definitely we believe that democracy is good for Indonesia, but we know that in order this democratic system to deliver a good thing, need, there are so many things need to be built. The rule of law, justice system, the quality of the debate that is in terms of the civil society, the middle class role is actually is very important. The second question is about decoupling. Well, when I said that the Southeast Asia and East Asia in general is actually the region which is getting the benefit of global economy, trade to GDP ratio is more than 100. So their prosperity has been built based on their connection or ability to sell their goods to outside the region. Now the issue of decoupling is becoming a little bit actually betraying their historical path. What we are saying that many will actually quite hopeful that when the global economic weaken, they can still maintain a positive economic growth. So there is now maybe an observation or a hope or expectation that this is going to be decoupling. What is actually happening is that this region is big enough so they have a strong domestic demand has been built. For Southeast Asia, we have 600 million. Income per capita, 4,000. Of course, for Singapore, it's much higher, close to 40,000. China, you have 1.3 billion people with income per capita close to 4,000. India in this case. So all these ASEAN country, 
they've already now because of capitalizing their perf economic performance based on their linkage to the global economy by exporting they have built a strong domestic basis so when the global economic weakening they still can sustain their economic performance by relying on the domestic demand. It doesn't mean that they are going to be continuously, because definitely domestic demand is going to be more balanced in providing and contributing to the growth. And that's why you can say that the reliance to the global economy, but I, I, I am not in the position that they are going to be totally decoupled with uh, Western or Europe or United States. They contribute, they have enjoyed the benefit of being globalized and linked to that. They are now actually also trying to globalize other parts of the world outside the United States. And that's why China is now have a very strong relationship with the Latin America. Many of the Latin America also have a growing interest to China. Middle East is doing the same thing. South Asia with the East, South East Asia. So you have quite of Eastern Europe now try to defeat or try to diversify their export. So I think the globalization or linkage is still going to be there because they know and they see it from historical and uh, uh, empirical evidence. It can really in, in improve your economic performance, but certainly they now have to play a role in which they're balancing their growth model, both for their own domestic sustainability, but also in terms of creating balanced growth globally. So imbalances globally as well as imbalances domestically need to be corrected. And that correction will not lead to decoupling. They are going to be still coupled, but they are going to be more balanced. Unfortunately, uh, we're, our time is up. I know there's many hands up there that people still have questions. Uh, sorry about that, but uh, at, uh, Ibu Sirmulyani has a busy schedule and we're gonna have to respect that. We've already run over time. Uh, Ibu Sirmulyani, thank you very much. I think you've challenged all of us and expanded our thinking on the role of governance in not only in, in, in Asia, but globally, but uh, for those of us interested in Southeast Asia, it was particularly challenging. So thank you very much. Thank you.